Good morning, Rocky Peak. How are you today? Doing all right? It's good to be gathered together. Hey, before we jump into our time of teaching, I, I wanted to make sure you knew of something really cool that happened this weekend. There was a, a team of Rocky Peakers that went down to Mexico, about 64 people, adults and youth, that together got to be a part of building a home for a family and serving in local communities in the hope of sharing the good news and the message of Jesus through actions. And so I just want to make sure that you're aware of that because that's an extension of us and collectively it's who we get to be as a church. And so as we just jump in, I just want to take a moment and pray for the impact of that time. And I don't know if they're still traveling, if they're back yet or not, but also just, oh, they made it. There they go. Awesome. So we're going to pray for them and for the impact that they had. And so uh, if, you, if you're new and you're like, how does this prayer thing work? It's like basically we just take our words and we speak them to God, trusting that he's hearing and that he's going to meet us in that. And so when I say pray with me, what you could just do as I'm praying is just go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then we're doing it together. All right. Sound good? All right. Uh-huh. There we go. All right. So Father, thank you so much that we get to be a part of your church and, and we get to be a part of your kingdom that's coming to bring life and hope and restoration and, and that you let us have a reach beyond just ourselves and you invite us into parts of the world where we can bring the good of you towards others, whether that's wells in Africa or our neighbors just to the south down in Mexico. And so God, thank you for this crew that's here today after a long weekend showing up to sit in the service with us. And God, I just ask that as they roll into this week that you would bless them in all the effort and energy that they spent for others. I love your, your word in the Proverbs that says, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And so would they be refreshed by your spirit this week, knowing that they, they invested their lives in something that will have lasting impact. And so I just pray for the families that were blessed, that they would see the reality of you, that Jesus, the reality of your goodness and love would be so real for them as they experience that through your church reaching out to them. And so thank you that we get to do things in your name in this world, that our lives can count for something more than just the sum total of years we have, that we can make a difference that echoes into eternity. In your name, Jesus, amen. 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 Well, hey, my name is Joel, and if we haven't met, we just did. So hello, how are you? Uh, we're going to continue in this series that we've been in, in Corinthians. And before we do that, I just, I want to ask if you've ever had this kind of experience happen. Like maybe you got, uh, got in like a text thread with a group of friends and you're chatting and trying to make plans. And then this dreaded moment happens. Like a week ago, some of our friends, we were trying to coordinate something to get together. And so we got into this very critical moment where we needed to hear back from our one friend, some key information about what was going to happen. And we looked in the thread and this is what we see. Just the dreaded dot, 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 right? And so we're in this moment where it's like, hey, you, like, can you please answer? Because we don't know what's happening next. We don't know where the plans are going. We need you to respond. And it's annoying when it's just blank. Like, okay, like they haven't got, but what's annoying is when you see that they're in mid-response and they haven't said anything, right? And it's just like dot, dot, dot. And you're like, oh, because you're stuck in like this holding pattern of what's to come. I, I don't know if you've ever felt like that in the journey of faith. Like, like the reality, like, like you've experienced something of Jesus in your story and you know that it's good and you know he has more for you, but you don't fully know what that is. And, and it just feels like you're in this, maybe a holding pattern with him. And, and like, you're, you're wondering like, Jesus, is there more for my story with you than just this dot, dot, dot? Like, I feel like I'm stuck. Like, do you have more for me? And the amazing thing is, think is when we begin to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us, I, I think that when we find ourselves stuck in the holding pattern, stuck in the dot, 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 that what we might actually realize is that maybe we've actually missed something, that there is more for us than just that. Like when Jesus shows up in the scene, like he fundamentally changes our story. Like when, when you encounter him, you begin to realize that he came to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves. Like we just celebrated the reality of all that a couple weeks ago with Easter, right? Like Jesus came and he went to that cross on our behalf to take upon himself the consequence of our brokenness and our sin so that we could have the hope of forgiveness and in him the hope of a radically new life that's changed forever. And I don't think Jesus did that and I don't think Easter happened so that he would look at us and say, well, good luck with that. And then we're stuck in a dot, dot, dot. It seems to me that when we understand what Easter is all about, Easter fundamentally changes our stories forever, that we are not stuck in the reality of a dot, 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 that because of the hope of Easter, we have this beautiful therefore in our story, a therefore that changes our lives today and changes how we live in the hope of what's yet to come. 
And so as we jump in today, we're going to chase after this therefore and see what God would have for us. So I'm going to pray again as we go into this time of teaching because I just want to make sure that Jesus is showing up because it needs to be his words that we're hearing because he has the words that will lead us to life. And so let's pray. And again, if you don't know what to do, just say, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. And so Jesus, we want to come into this place, into this moment with with the hope that you are going to move, that you have life for us, life yet to even be fully realized and discovered. And and so as we step into the space, we just want to come before you and, and give you permission to speak, to give you permission for your spirit to eliminate the words of this book that are God breathed, that are from you for us so that we could hear your voice clearly. Would you come and show us what you have for us in this life? Would you move us beyond wherever we may find ourselves stuck in a holding pattern? If there's a dot, dot, dot in our story today, would we realize that we have something greater than that, that you have moved, and because of you, there's a therefore that changes our lives and how we choose to live. And so give us ears to hear the things that you have for us. In your name, amen. Amen. So we're going to jump into our series that we've been in. So in your programs, you have some message notes that'll help you follow along. But we're in this series that we've called Christ, Culture, and the Cross. And we've been taking a look at one of the letters we have in our Bibles that was written by one of the early Christian leaders, a guy named Paul. And so Paul was writing to this church that he had helped get started in the first century in the city of Corinth. And so then he had left to kind of do some more things in his journey. And so he's writing this letter back to them to help them. Because if you've been a part of this series for any length of time, you know we've been working our way through this series for a length of time. Because this is a church that needed help. (laughs) Because they had allowed the culture around them and the values around them to deter them from the life Jesus had. And Paul's just helping to speak back into them as like a father and somebody looking out for them. This is the life that you are meant to live. And so this is why Corinthians is such a powerful book because we are very much like them in our own day where it's very easy for us to get deterred by the values of our culture and the ways of our world that we could actually lose sight of what Jesus has for us and and get spun into ways like them. And so what he's dealing with for them in the first century, isn't it amazing how humans are humans regardless of when and where we live and how easily we can just make the same mistakes as others. And so the hope is that the words that he spoke then could also shape our lives today if we'll listen and pay attention and let God move. And so what Paul's dealing with that we've been seeing the last couple of weeks in what we call chapter 15 of this letter in 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with this interesting issue that was coming up amongst them where, where they were followers of Jesus, but who were beginning to wonder if there was actually the reality of a resurrection that was to come. And the reason that they're getting caught up in this is, again, they're in a cultural place that's very diverse. It's got Greco-Roman influence and Jewish influence and other things that were coming in. And in that sea of ideas, there were many competing views on what happens next. And so for them, this idea of resurrection was being challenged by Greco-Roman thoughts of what the afterlife would be. And so it wasn't that the Greco-Romans didn't believe in an afterlife. They just believed in a very different afterlife than the one Jesus was talking about. So for them, the issue wasn't, is there an afterlife? Like that's some of the cultural pressure we feel today. Like our version of that might be like scientific naturalism that's a part of our worldviews around us. And that challenge, like people might laugh at the idea of resurrection because for them, death is the end, that's it. In the first century, the laughter wouldn't be that death was the end. It's be like, you believe in a resurrection? Like the the afterlife that the other worlds or worldviews would have believed in was what we would might call a disembodied existence. So for the the Greco-Romans, the goal of life was to hit eject someday and to be a disembodied spirit existing in some kind of ether in a future moment, which is fundamentally different than the the future life that Jesus talked about, than the one that God promised. Because like God's like, hey, my creation is good, but it's broken, and I've come to restore it. And I want to restore all of it, including you and all of you. So that this hope of this new heavens and this new earth requires a new version of us in a fullness of who we are, which requires a resurrection. And so Paul's been like, like kind of chasing this out with these Corinthians. Like, hey, some of you have bought in to the values of your culture, and you need to understand that's fundamentally in opposition to the very faith you say you claim. And so like, if there is no resurrection, Paul says this earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, hey, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus didn't resurrect. And if Jesus hasn't resurrected, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Like, so it kind of matters. 
Like it's a big deal whether or not there was an actual resurrection because it matters for the story. Because if there is no resurrection, there is no therefore in our story and we're all stuck in the dot, dot, dot. But the good news that we've seen because of Easter two weeks ago as we've learned through this is that there is a resurrection. And because of that, there's a hope in all of our stories. And so Paul wants to continue framing this hope so that the Corinthians in the first century would know where they could live in the hope that they have, that there is a therefore in their story. And it's the same truth that we can grab hold of in our stories today. And so we're going to jump in and continue to work through chapter 15, what Paul's saying. But instead of jumping in at 35, where we need to continue, I want to move to the very end of chapter 15 first, to verse 58, to see what Paul's been driving at this whole point, this whole time as we jump in. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. What's the very first word? Therefore. I'll say, don't miss this. There's a therefore in the story. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And this is some powerful encouragement that Paul's throwing down here at the end of this chapter where he's making the case for the resurrection and its implications for us, that there's a therefore in the story. And because of that, these encouragements, like the first encouragement is this idea, he's saying, hey, stand firm. Like, let nothing move you. Like, do not be swayed by the ideas or the ways or the challenges of this world that you're living in. Because the world is in opposition or is often going in a different direction than what God has. And there's a hope in your story now that allows you to stand firm in the face of all of that. And so like this idea of standing firm and letting it move you would be like this. Don't be swayed then by the ideas or the ways or challenges. Like don't be swayed by the ideas of this world because the world often believes things that are radically different than the reality that God wants to tell us, the things that God wants to give us. And we were seeing this in the Corinthians' own story, how they were being swayed by a different view of the afterlife that was fundamentally taking out the ground from under their own feet of their own faith. And so like, no, you need to not let the world decide how you will think. Let Jesus lead you into the right way of thinking. But also don't be swayed by the ways of this world. Because again, the way the world operates is often not always in alignment with God's design and God's desires for us. And again, we are seeing how the Corinthians were caught up in this. So if you've been a part of the series, you know over the, the last months as we've unpacked some of the things that they were met, they're struggling with, there was issues that they were dealing with. So for them, they were caught up in the values and ways of their own culture. So sexually, they were missing out what God wanted from them in that arena of life that he created, and they were just doing what the world around them would do. So they were like getting involved with the, the pagan practices in their day. And so like they would be going to the pagan temples, worshiping the pagan gods, sleeping with the temple prostitutes, and then showing up at church and being like, hey, it's all good. And they're like, Paul's like no, no, not good. Like that's the broken way of the world. It's a way of brokenness. God's called you to live in something different. They were also experiencing the broken ways of their culture around them and how they were interacting with one another socially. Like, because what our world wants to do is to take us and define us and divide us in all sorts of categories. So oftentimes the way you experience that is like socioeconomic division amongst us. And so the Corinthians experienced that, right? Remember, same people, same time, same problems. And so what they were experiencing was not the new identity and who they were as followers of Christ. They were allowing the social structures of their day to cause division amongst them. So much so that as they would gather and meet, they were the haves and the have-nots, and the haves were neglecting the have-nots and taking the best seats and making it all about them. And Paul's like, what are you doing? Like, you've been given a new life, a new identity, and when we come to Jesus, it doesn't matter where we're coming from, at the foot of the cross, we're all on level playing field, which is people in desperate need of help and hope. And the beautiful thing is that we find the same help and the same hope through Jesus which means that how the world defines us no longer defines us as we chase him together. We're brought into something beautiful called his church, his family. We're all brothers and sisters at the cross. And so they were missing this. They were also missing this because they were caught up in the ways of the world and how they dealt with each other relationally. So we saw this earlier in Paul's letter. Like he has to tell them things like this. Stop ripping each other off. You're like, like what? Like, like you shouldn't do that anyways. But then thinking like, like, like a, a group of Christians doing life together and then taking advantage of one another and ripping each other off, like that shouldn't happen. Unfortunately, it did, and it does. 
I don't know about you, but when I'm in, interacting like in a business moment and someone hands me their business card and it's got the little fish on it, I'm a little more skeptical than not, unfortunately, right? But that fish should mean something different about that person in their character, right? And so Paul's calling them out on all sorts of things because they were being swayed by the ways of this world. And so that's why he's saying, hey, you need to stand firm and let nothing move you. Don't let how this world operates determine who you're going to be and what you're going to do. But then he also says the second encouragement in verse 58, hey, your labor, it's not in vain. Like what you do with your life for Jesus matters because what you do will have a lasting impact. And so in this verse 58, Paul is throwing out some powerful things. Hey, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Your labor is not in vain. And if we take this piece of what Paul's saying here all by itself, the question I just have naturally is, why, Paul? Like, why? Why should I stand firm? Why should I understand that my labor is not in vain? Because without a clear why behind this, This comes across to me as almost just like Paul's just trying to psych us up. Like he's just giving us a hype message, right? And I don't know about you, but I I, I appreciate passion and I appreciate when someone gets excited and they get hyped up. But what I want beyond the hype is substance. So I show up here week after week because I want inspiration for my story. But I want to leave here more than just feeling good because I guarantee you Monday at 10 a.m., those feelings go away fast. What I want beyond hype is to know that I can build my life more than just an emotional high, that there's a foundation that is firm and solid that I can build my life on. And when the emotions go away on Monday, it's still worth giving my life for because it's secure. This is why I want to know, Paul, why? Why should I stand firm and not let the ways of this world move me? Why should I give myself fully to the work of the Lord? And the reason Paul would tell us to is because There is a therefore in this moment, a therefore that fundamentally changes how we live our lives. And so let's go back earlier into his chapter now and see what he's saying to build up to this moment to help us understand why there's hope in our story and why there is a therefore here. And so back in verse 35, we're going to jump back to there. And Paul's continuing this conversation with the Corinthians about why the resurrection is real and why it matters. And so he's going to respond here in verse 35 to a possible objection. And so he says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And so like what Paul's anticipating is that somebody might be like, well, Paul, I I don't understand how this works. And so the objection being raised is how, how will the resurrection happen? How will this all go down? And like, this is an interesting moment because I, I don't know if you've ever wrestled with how in your own story or your own journey, like God is doing something or there's something that you're trying to wrap your mind around in the area of faith. And you're like, yeah, but how does that work? Or God, how did you do that? Or what will that look like? And, and you've wrestled with that question. And you know what happens whenever we ask the question, how, you know what we're revealing? We're not revealing an objection. You know what we're revealing? Our ignorance. Like, just because I don't understand how something works or is going to work or did work doesn't mean that it didn't or it won't happen, that we have to press into something more. And so here's Paul responding to this. I remember when I was in school, I had a teacher that was sharing one day in class his journey of coming to faith and how once upon a time in his own journey, he was just very antagonistic and anti anything that had to do with like Jesus and Christianity. And and so he was just describing in his relationships how he would oftentimes talk with his friends and just challenge them with questions like, well, how did that happen? And how do you know? And all these how questions. And a lot of times he would just encounter like Christians like, I don't know, I don't know. And it was like, to him, it was like this drop, drop mic moment where he shut it down until one day he realized, I'm not even chasing my own questions. And he said, I, I suddenly realized I was like the artful dodger that was never really wrestling with the, the reality of what was going on. And so he said, so something dangerous happened to me. I began to chase my questions. And as I changed, chased those questions, I suddenly met Jesus. And so here I am now, one of his. <laughs> and so I love this. So Paul's like, hey, you might be wondering, like, how is this going to happen? And so his response is this, how foolish. <laughs> what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And so now Paul's going to be using this harvest planting analogy. Like if you plant a seed in the soil, that seed effectively dies, but a new life comes, is sprung from it. And so he goes, when you sow, 
You do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he is determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives it its own body. So he goes on, because now he's going to say, hey, there's different kinds of bodies, and there's different kinds of splendors in these different bodies. So he says, not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And stars differ from star and splendor. And so what you're saying is like, hey, there are different kinds of bodies, and there are different kinds of expressions of that, and some are more splendorful than others. Like, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to see like a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, like through the Hubble Space Telescope. Like, that's spectacular when you look at that. And you look at that, like, that is a splendorful expression of body. And then if you were to take that picture and, I don't know, put it up next to like a catfish, you think, not, not as cool, right? Like, the catfish is like, that's pretty phenomenal, this, this creature, but compared to the splendor to come. And so what Paul's doing now is he's going to draw an analogy, a comparison that, hey, there's a body that we have now, but it's got nothing compared to the splendor of the one that's to come. He says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, and it is raised imperishable. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are old enough to know right now that the body you're in is perishing? Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, young people over here, oh, enjoy it. <laughs> like, I'm old enough now that, like, sometimes I wake up and it hurts. And all I did was sleep. You're like, what happened? Like, why does this hurt? Like, because, like, these bodies that we are in are part of a broken world, which means that they're, like, we've got this factory defect because of what happened in the beginning story when sin entered and broke and wrecked everything. And like, I, I look at like what Paul's talking about here and it's interesting, the older I get, the more I feel the weight of the perishable. Because like, I remember when I was in like, like my young mid twenties and like you, you just felt indestructible. I remember my, like my best friend and I went, we were at Yosemite and we're like, let's go up and hike to Half Dome. And so I remember like, we were like mountain goats. We ran up to Half Dome, looked around and ran back down and had lunch. I would die if I had to do that today. Right? Like, it's just, that's the reality. And you know, what Paul is helping us understand is like, listen, the, the resurrection is the hope of something new, something imperishable, because the body that is sown, it's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory, it's sown in weakness, it's raised in power, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. Like, whatever 2.0 is going to be like, it's going to be incredible. And so Paul goes on, he goes, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So Paul's going to do a little bit of a comparison here between the first man, Adam, and then the second Adam he's talking about is Jesus, what Jesus came to do. And he's talking about how like, Adam became a living being. If you go in Genesis 2, that account of the creation of the human race, we're told that God did something unique with us. Like he formed the man from the dust of the earth and then we're told that he breathed his breath of life into the man. That we became living beings because God put his breath of life in us. And we were meant to live in a beautiful world but when we turned away from God, that got broken. And so now we live in perishable bodies that are breaking and what we need is the hope of someone who will come and fix the problem on our behalf. And that's the second Adam, that's Jesus who comes and gives us this life-giving spirit. Like, I, like, jump back in the letter with me just for a minute to verse 21, because you see where Paul has already set up this parallel between Adam and Christ. And so he says this, he goes, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. So like, like death is a part of the story because of the first man and his choice. By the way, have you ever just kind of been like, had a beef with Adam over that whole thing? Like, bro, thank you. Like, you screwed it up for all of us. And yet I know myself enough to know that I've made my own choices. And if I had been the dude in the garden, we'd still all be in the same boat, 
right? Like, can, like, so yeah, we can blame Adam, but we gotta look in the mirror too. And the reality is that because there's death in our story because of the first man, we need a new man who will come in the story and do something new for us that we can't. And that's what Jesus has done. The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Like Jesus is like a preview of coming attractions. When we see what happened to him when he defeated death, when he came back from the dead that first Easter, he he received the new spiritual body. Whatever 2.0 is, Jesus had it. And so when we look at him, we get a preview of what's to come. But don't miss what he says. There's an order. Jesus first, then when he comes, when he comes to restore all things, will follow for those who what? Belong to him. That should cause all of us to ask an important question. Jesus, do I really belong to you? Because if I want the life you have, I need to align my life with you so that I get to step into this new world and this new reality with you when you come back to do this for all of us. So back in verse 45, the the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, the spiritual body, but the natural body, and after that, the spiritual The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Do not miss the implications of what Paul is saying there. Just as as we all bear the image of the first Adam, we will bear the image of the new Jesus when he comes back. Do you catch what that means? As Jesus became in his resurrection, that's the hope that we will receive that same reality in our story. Which when when I hear that, I'm like, Paul, I have so many questions. Like, can you tell me more about what that's like? Because we see glimpses of Jesus in the gospels after the resurrection. And so one of the questions is, will we be like that? Like those times when Jesus' disciples were hanging out and suddenly Jesus just showed up in the room and the door was locked and he's like, boo. Like, will we get to do that? Like, will we have that? Like, what will that look like? Or is that because he was Jesus? Like second person, like, I don't know. And, And I love it. Like Christy will often talk about this. Like sometimes we just have to exercise our faith imagination as we look to the hope of what's to come and wonder what will it be like? Because I don't know about you, but I, I can't wait to experience the imperishable because that's gonna be a really cool moment. Like I love my five senses right now, but they are fading as I get older. Like I look forward to the day when I don't wear contacts, when I have 2020 vision like no one else. And what, what I wonder in the new version of me, the imperishable version of me, is will I not only have 20-20 vision, but will I be able to see things in ways I can't even see now because it will be a perfected me, not a broken me. Right, like what, what I mean, can you just imagine that? Like, what will it be like? And not only will we be an imperishable version, a perfected version of ourselves physically, we'll be perfected versions of ourselves internally, and God's new world will have zero sin and zero brokenness in it, which means that we will be in alignment with him, which means that I will look at him and I will always want what he wants because I'm smart enough to know that his, his way is the right way and the good way, and I'll have the power to live it out in ways I can't right now. Imagine what we could do in a new universe in 2.0 versions of us. I can't wait to meet that guy. I can't wait to meet you. And until then, we're waiting for that time when he'll return. And so I think we need to not lose sight of this so that we have hope of what's to come as we live today. A few weeks ago, uh, 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 some of us got to do a, a Q&A panel with our middle school students for their midweek program. And they're just asking all sorts of questions. And so we're just trying to like, respond and engage with the questions. And, and yet so many of their questions had to do with this next life, what's to come. And, and it was really fun to hear some of the things like, like how, won't we get bored just singing songs forever in heaven? <laughs> you know, have you, oh, come on, we're adults, but have you ever wondered that? Like even here, some, I, I love our worship, but sometimes you're like, another round of the verse? Like... Really? Like, do you ever, like, and, and I think the reason why is because we misunderstand what worship is. We think worship is about our preferences instead of the one we're worshiping. I mean, you look at the story, like in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, he has got this picture of God in all his glory, and he's surrounded by these angelic beings that would look like something out of a horror movie if we saw them in real life. Like, they're not chubby cherubs playing harps. 
And these angels are surrounding the holiness of God and they're crying out to one another in worship, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty because they are taken with his awe, his wonder. And then John in Revelation has a vision and he sees the same thing. And I don't know how many millennia have gone by between Isaiah's vision and John's vision, but they're singing the same song because they are not bored. They're experiencing the one who they were created to be taken by and given fully to. And I think sometimes we, we lack imagination of what the next life is, so we settle for stupid things today. I think it's like trying to explain to a small child like, like what Disneyland is like, and the only thing they can imagine is the stupid little broken down pony outside the grocery store that you drop a quarter in that like rocks back and forth to some lame music. And you're like, Disneyland sounds lame. That's not what it's like. They've got Star Wars, like don't you understand? <laughs> Like, it's so much greater than this. And like what Paul is helping us understand is like this resurrection hope will be something that transforms our lives then but gives us hope for our lives today. And so then he begins to paint a picture of, of what that moment might be like when Christ returns. And so in verse 50, he says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Because what God is doing requires a whole human makeover a completely new version of us, which is the hope that we have. Like Jesus didn't come simply to save our souls. He came to transform us in our entirety. And there's this hope that's coming. And so he says, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That means we will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. And he's talking about this future moment that Jesus promised that he said, hey, I'm gonna come back. And when I come back, it's to now restore all things and to fix all that's broken. And Paul's saying like, if, if, if we're dead before then, if we've fallen asleep, the hope is that we will be resurrected in that moment. And so that seed planted will be raised in an imperishable body. And if we're still living when that moment happens, it will be like this, like we step into this new version of us instantly as Christ returns. And this is this beautiful hope that Jesus said. Remember what he said to his first followers? Hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I'm done, I'm what? I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back so that you can be with me where I am. Oh, and then Paul says, verse 53, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And see, when that moment happens, when we step into the new that Jesus has for us, death dies as we step into immortality with him forever. Like the new version of us will not experience decay because all the brokenness and the sin has been dealt with and we experience something new, this next life that Jesus has. And our hope is that it will happen because he already did it and he's the first fruits. He's the preview of coming attractions. And so Paul goes on and he throws out these, these fighting words almost. Hey, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? So, hey, Jesus defeated you. So what do you got, bro? <laughs> like, is that all you got? I love this. It's like, he's like, death, is, death doesn't have its hold over us anymore. Death is a reality, though, because the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Like, our, our sin and our rebellion led us in this place of death, and God's calling us out into something better. But we have this hope because of verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, that's the hope that we have, that what Jesus accomplished on that first Easter was his victory over death, so that in him we have the hope that his victory is now our victory as well, that we are not defined by the brokenness or the perishable. We have a hope of something that will come that's greater, which means that we are not stuck in a holding pattern. We are not stuck with a dot, dot, dot. There is a therefore in our story because of Jesus and his resurrection which is why Paul can say, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Which means that we have to lift our eyes beyond the world as it is and life as it is and see this future hope that's coming 
and say, Jesus, give me eyes to see that so I don't get stuck in the dot, 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 but I begin to live in the reality of this therefore that fundamentally changes my story. And so as we move past this time of year where we celebrate Easter, I want to make sure that we understand that Easter is a celebration of every day of every calendar until he comes back. It's not something that we want. Because what happens in my story, just tell me if this resonates with you. I lose sight of this, and I get stuck now. And I let the dot, dot, dot determine how I live my life instead of the therefore. Am I the only one? Anyone else? You can elbow them if you need them to acknowledge me. That's fine. (laughs) Right? Yes. It happens, doesn't it? And so let's chase this idea of what happens because of the hope of the resurrection, how we can stand firm and not be moved by the things of this world, how we can give our life fully to Jesus. So three things that that we don't have to get caught up in anymore because of the hope of the resurrection. So there on your notes. First one is this. Because of the hope of the resurrection, we do not dismiss life now. We don't dismiss the life we're living now because the life we're living now matters for the life to come. And I think oftentimes we can make this mistake in how we think about life today, that we can fall into this mistake of thinking that, hey, because there's a next life, then then this one doesn't really matter, and I can just kind of do my own thing. And you you might find yourself falling into this reality if you begin to treat Jesus more like your fire insurance instead of King and Lord, who you give your life to. Because oftentimes it's really easy to be like, hey, Jesus, thank you for all that. I'll see you later. Like, I'll call on you when the time comes instead of I'll give my life to you because you're worthy of all of me. And Jesus tells this really intense, powerful story about how we live life now and how it matters for the next life. In Matthew 25, he tells this story, a, a, a parable, one of his parables, and, and it's this, this story. He goes, okay, there's this, this master who, who goes on a trip, and while he's away, he entrusts his resources to some of his servants. And so to the first servant, he gives like a large sum of money and says, okay, use this wisely while I'm gone. To the second servant, he gives about half the amount. Same thing, use this wisely while I'm gone. To the third servant, he gives like, here's a coin. Use this wisely while I'm gone. And then he goes away. And then the first two get to work with what they've been entrusted, the resources given to them, and they leverage it. So when the master comes back, there's something to show with what they've been given. But the third takes it and buries it in the ground. And then Jesus says something intense. Then the master comes back. He he talks to all of them, but when he jumps to the end of the parable, what he says to the third one, he's like, you worthless servant. Like you you, you wasted the life that I entrusted to you. So he's like, take what was given to him and give it to the other one, the first one. That's heavy. Like like it matters what we do with this life. But there's also hope in the story that he says because the two that took what was entrusted to them and leveraged it, look what the master says to them in Jesus' story. Matthew 25, verse 21 and 23, he says the same thing to both of them. To those that had taken what they'd been given and used it well, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Like they were able to take what had been entrusted to them and leverage it so that they could then step into more of what the master had for them. And it's that same invitation with us. And so what that means is that we do not dismiss life now. Like do not check out. You are not simply biding time until then. You're building a future life now as you invest it for his kingdom come. And so we do not dismiss life now because of the hope of the resurrection. Here's something else. Because of the hope of the resurrection, we do not demand our own way as we live life now. One of the amazing things that the cross and Jesus' resurrection shows us is like just incredibly how much God loves us that he would do this for us. So like one of maybe the most famous verses in our culture today that, that's, that's still fairly known is John 3.16. And if you don't know what it is, you probably saw the sign at a football game once upon a time. Right? But John 3.16, these beautiful, powerful words that God loved the world. That's you, me, that's everyone in it. He loved us so much that he gave his son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have the hope of eternal life. 
that Jesus has come to do something. And without him, we're on the road of perishing. But as we find life in him, he's, come to, he's the way, the truth, and the life. So as we trust in him, we, we step into something new. And, and, and sometimes I think what we think is like, well, yeah, but I made myself good enough so God would come and do that for me. And like, no, 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 you did not. No, I did not. I love what Paul writes in Romans 5, 8. He says these words. This is how God demonstrates his love for us this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like the implication of that for you and me is that when we were at our worst, God gave us his best in the hope that he could lead us into something new through Jesus with him. And so we are incredibly loved by God. And yet I think one of the mistakes that we can make with this when it comes to kind of demanding our own way in life is that it's easy to look at ourselves as we are and to think that because God loves us, then how we are is how we're meant to be. And so we look at however we find ourselves in life and we say, well, obviously this is how I'm supposed to be. God loves me. And let me tell you, that's a subtle shift, but when that flip gets switched, it leads to dangerous thinking and our thinking gets muddled fast. And here's one of the ways that we see this showing up in our culture today, and it's in the area of our sexuality and our understanding of our identity because it's getting blurred and confusing it, it, it very much like, I look at the things that my daughters are being taught in school and I'm like, but is that what God says? Is that what God wants? Is that what God was calling you into? Or is that just the ways and values of our culture? And see, I think one of the things that we have to wrestle with with this whole, this whole thing is, is it our desires that define our identity? Or is it God's design and his desires for us that define our identity? And see, how you answer that question fundamentally changes how you live your life today. And see, when I think it's my desires, then I began to demand my own way. Well, obviously I'm supposed to be like this. God loves me. And when we do that, when we apply that thinking, the danger is suddenly anything goes. Because just apply that logic to other areas of life. Let's just say, like I, I were to say, like I'm just, I'm a womanizer and I'm a misogynist. And I were to say, but that's who I'm supposed to be. That's how I'm supposed to be because God loves me. W wouldn't you want to have a conversation with me? Especially as a guy raising daughters. Like, no, no. Or if I were to say like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an angry person and I have anger issues, but God loves me, so that's obviously how I'm supposed to be. Like there's a danger in that thinking, right? And here's what we need to understand, that God's love for us is not an affirmation of how we are. His love for us is an affirmation of who he is and what he's come to do for us in his desire to lead us into our best life as we trust him with all of us. His love is an affirmation of him. And see, Jesus didn't come for us because he thought we were awesome as we are. It's not like Jesus showed up in my story and said, Joel, you're amazing. Can I be on your team? Can I follow you? It's like, no, he showed up in my story and he's like, bro, you are a mess. And I love you. Follow me, and I will lead you into the life you were created for. And see, for us to step into this new life with Jesus that he offers us, it requires surrendering our perishable life to him so that we have the hope of the new life he wants to give us. Look what Jesus says about this, Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And see, there's a hope in what Jesus is saying there is that when we encounter him and we're willing to surrender ourselves as we are, that's when we gain the new life he wants to give us the life he wants to lead us into. There's a quote I put there from a, a, on your notes from a guy named Jim Elliott. Uh, if you don't know this guy's life or his story, Google him this week. Jim Elliott was a, a missionary that lived in the last century in the 40s. And he and his family and a group of friends, they had this passion and this calling on their life to go and share the message of Jesus with an unreached people group. So people that had not yet heard the reality of Jesus. And and some, so they had done a lot of research and a lot of work to try to make contact and, and to build rapport with this group that had never had contact with the outside world. 
And so they would fly over and they would drop gifts and do all sorts of things. And then finally the day comes when they're going to land and make first contact in person. And so they land their planes that day along the river. And every single one of the men who got out of the plane was killed by this people group. Because there was a big misunderstanding. And yet the amazing thing is God's triumph in the face of tragedy because Jim Elliott's wife Elizabeth and the other families continued to reach out to this group and brought the message of Jesus until the whole group came to understand who Jesus was and began to follow him. It's an amazing story. It's worth taking a look at. And I love what Jim writes in one of his journals as he's just wrestling with the cost of giving his life to Jesus. And he says these words, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. And see, it's not foolishness to surrender to the perishable version of ourself in the hope and anticipation of the new version that he wants to give us and what he wants to put in our lives. And see, Jesus is inviting us to follow him in to version (laughs) 2.0. And that's our hope. Because of the hope of the resurrection, we do not demand our way. We surrender ourselves so we can live in his way and the life that he has for us. The third thing here, that because of the hope of the resurrection, we do not, we do not despair in our losses. And that's not to say that we don't grieve when we experience loss. Because the reality of living life in this broken world is it's hard. Like, this is not how it was meant to be. And when we experience loss, it's real and it's hurt and we feel the weight of it. And grieving is the right response to loss. Even Jesus grieved when he walked this earth. You see this powerful story in John chapter 11 that he's showing up to the graveside of his friend Lazarus. And and if you know the story, you know it's this incredible story of him just demonstrating the awesome power that he came to wield in this world. And yet the amazing thing is that Earlier in John 11, Jesus gets word from Lazarus' sisters, hey, Lord, come, the one you love, he's sick. And they know that if he can show up in time, he could, he could heal him because Jesus had this ability. And so they're like, please come. And yet we know that Jesus intentionally waits because he knows there's a bigger story that needs to happen. And then when he shows up, it's too late because Lazarus is already dead. And the amazing thing is that we see Jesus' response in that moment. Even though we know what's going to happen if you know the story, you know he's going to speak to Lazarus, call him out of the grave. He's going to raise him from the dead. It's going to be an epic celebration. But in the face of the loss and the hurt and the grief all around him, John eleven thirty five, 35, these two beautiful words, Jesus wept. Because in the face of the loss, he understood this is not how I created it to be. This is not what was meant to be for the human race. And he weeps in that loss, even though he knows he's going to have victory over all of it. And so the reason I say we don't despair in our losses is despair is grief without hope. But because of the resurrection, even in the midst of our deepest grief, there's always a seed of hope. That he's at work doing something new, that death does not get the final word. Jesus said in John 15, the last night he's hanging out with his men, he said to his first followers, he goes, hey, now is your time of grief, but you will see me again, and in that day, no one will take away your joy because there's a greater day coming. And at the end of the book of Revelation, in Revelation 21, John has this beautiful picture of the coming new kingdom that God is gonna do where heaven and earth come together. And in this beautiful picture, we see that God brings his residence to us and we're united with him forever. And in Revelation 21, we're told that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes because there will be no more mourning or death or suffering evermore. The old order of things is gone. Like that's the hope of what's before us. And then because of the resurrection, we have a hope that transcends the perishable years we're living right now. And because of that hope, we can look forward with expectation that one day all that is lost will be redeemed, that he will change the story forever. And so I love what Paul writes here about this. And in his second letter to the Corinthians, I love that they have two because they needed help. (laughs) But in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes these words, in light of what Jesus has done, therefore we do not lose heart. 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. All because of the resurrection of Jesus, the first fruits, he's the hope of what we get to experience in our own story. And so because of the resurrection, we do not dismiss life now. We do not demand our own way. We do not despair in our losses. Instead, we live in the reality of this epic therefore that changes our story forever. Because of the resurrection, we can do this. We can leverage today for eternity. And that's a great (laughs) soundbite. But if you're anything like me, sometimes you're like, I don't know what that means. Like, I I, I understand the hope behind it, but what does that look like? Because again, it's easy to get stuck in the dot, 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 isn't it? Okay, leverage my life for eternity. Okay, here I go. What do I do? And whenever you find yourself stuck in the dot, 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 you got to remember there's a therefore in the story. And so bring yourself back to the therefore. Come back to verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. So here's the question. Where do you need to stand firm today? Where do you need to not let yourself be moved by the ways of this world or the ideas of this world, but instead to say, Jesus, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give my life to you. And if the world is going this way, I'm going to say, that's not for me. I'm with you. And I'm going to start standing with you because of the life that you have for me, because that's part of the therefore that's in your story now. Or therefore, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so where do you need to start giving yourself fully to what Jesus has for you? Like where is he at work in your story today? Where is he stirring things in you that has your name on it and he's wanting to invite you into it so you can be a part of something greater than just yourself, that you can be a part of things where you leverage this perishable years for his kingdom come? And I don't know about you, but so oftentimes there are things that Jesus will call me to that I'm like, I can't do that, or I don't want to do that. And so often his response to me is just this gentle voice that says, dude, when has it ever been about you? Like maybe the greatest reality of freedom is to realize it's not about me. I've been set free from me to live for something greater. I love that we had a group that went down to Mexico this weekend. Like you guys stepped into something and experience something. And my hope and prayer is that this week, as you chase after him, you see the reality of that, that you realize it's not in vain what you did. So keep doing it over and over and keep investing your life in what he has for you because it is not in vain. So I love what Paul says here in Colossians 3. I love when you kind of see certain themes emerge in the scripture, you realize, oh, it's kind of all over the place. Like, because the hope of the resurrection is like the Christian hope. And so you start to see the themes explode all over the writings and the scriptures because you realize, oh, this is why we live now. And so here in another one of his letters to some other Christians, Paul writes this, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know the amazing thing about Jesus? Is that all the glory is his and he shares it. (laughs) Like he's like, hey, come here. I want you to share my happiness. Hey, look at this whole universe, everything, it was about me and my glory, but I am a giving person, and so come and step into this because I want you to share it. I want you to experience, this is the life you were made for, to stand in the glory of my presence and experience all of who I am, to unleash all of who you are in the world. And that's the hope that's coming, and so we need to look up when we get stuck in the dot, dot, dot. Lift our eyes beyond the now, beyond the temporary, beyond the struggle, the challenges, the temptations that we find ourselves in, to look beyond the fray and the fear and the follies that would hold us down. 
And to say, Jesus, I want the life that you have for me because you live, I too will live. So I'm gonna chase you into all that you wanna do in this world through my life. And the hope that we have is that every step of the way, he's with us in the journey because Jesus said, hey, in this world, you're gonna have trouble. But what? Take heart, I have overcome the world. You're with me now. So we need to look beyond the dot, 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 friends. You are not stuck in a holding pattern. There is a therefore in your story that changes how we live our lives because there is hope of a future day coming that fundamentally shapes how we live today. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. And so Jesus, thank you that you have come not only to set us free, not only to give us life, but give us the hope of a future. And so here in this place, would you remind us of who you are and what you've done, that you're the first fruits, that in you we see a picture of the hope that we have. And so we want to give ourselves fully to you, to step into that life. And so however many years we have left, would we leverage these perishable years? for the imperishable life that's to come. And so thank you for being good and being for us and calling us into life. Let us now live our lives in response to your goodness by giving you all of us today.